All right, we'll go ahead and get started. <clears throat> this is a meeting of the Sentencing Reform Subcommittee of the Equitable Justice Task Force. Uh, this morning, we're going to be talking about or discussing the drug court aspect of um, sentencing reform. Um, I don't anticipate we'll have another subcommittee meeting, but we, we might possibly have uh, prior to the full, uh, full committee getting back together. Um, but that would be, we'll have to confer with the co-chairman about that. So with that, I'm gonna open it up. The first speaker that we have that'll address the uh, committee this morning is uh, Judge Bruce Williams. Now it is, sorry, thank you. Again, I appreciate the opportunity to be here and, and talk a little about drug court. While uh, I have uh, had great pleasure serving on the Court of Appeals, the, the favorite, uh, uh, I guess, part of my job over the years has always been to be involved in drug courts for the last uh, 22 of them anyway. And so I still get to be involved and be a part of that. What I wanna do first, just so, um, you got this bill and it's, it, it's, it's interesting and, and, and has a lot of uh, important parts to it, but drug court still is about the people that come into drug court every day, people looking for help. And so the end result of what we do, I just kind of want to remind everybody a little bit about, here's kind of the outcome of what happens. I actually got involved in drugs at 12 because a girl I used to run with, her father dabbled in drugs. I would walk around the playground with her and she would tell me what being high was like and it started to pick my brain. What's this high? So one weekend, I went to her house and that was the first time I'd ever smoked a joint, drank some alcohol and I tried my first pill. At 19 years old, I started dating my drug dealer. He would give me drugs in exchange for us to be in a relationship. But the first time I stuck the needle in my arm, it was game over from there. So I started stealing. Me and two other people started stealing for our habit because at this point I had started shooting up. I was charged with 17 felonies and one misdemeanor. I had two to 20 years in prison looking over my head and I still wasn't taking it serious. I think what helped me with drug court is that everything was so structured. You're always held accountable. My parents loved me, my whole family loved me, but I needed somebody outside of them to say, Chelsea, you're going to die if you don't change your ways. Today, I'm the program director of Appalachian Health Services in Logan, West Virginia. I am currently working on my alcohol and drug counseling license, and I just recently graduated with my master's in social work. I'm helping a community get back what we have lost. Mr. Williams, you are sick and you don't even know it. My lawyer objected and said, Judge Rankin, Mr. Williams is an educated man. He's a former military officer. He, he works and has a wife and kids. And uh, he's a learned man. And Judge Rankin said, that's, that's his problem. He's too smart to know he's dying. Uh, I came to be involved in drug court because I could not stay sober. I got pulled over, Good Hope Road, 2008. Um, got a no paper citation to appear at East of the River Court, and all I had to do was give them three clean urines, just three. I could give them two, but something called a payday would come up between the second and third day, second and third test, that I was just incapable of not drinking or using um, when I had money in my pocket. I'll never forget it. Uh, we woke up early that morning from D.C. jail, and one thing I remember vividly is just the sound of chains, almost like being on a slave ship. And I realized, you know, I hadn't been a father in years and I hadn't been a husband in years. That maybe this is an opportunity for you to, to live for the first time since you can remember. By being immersed in the drug court continuum of care, being immersed in the AA 12-step program and having a wonderful network, uh, my desire to stay sober got greater than my desire to use. I am a 2009 graduate of the D.C. Superior Court uh, Drug Court Treatment Program, 
and my sobriety date is December 9th, 2008. And from that day to this day, I haven't found it necessary to drink or use substances. God put something on my spirit, uh, kind of gave me a business philosophy that says that uh, I dream with my eyes wide open, that I certainly have lived a nightmare with my eyes wide open, but th the gift of sobriety facilitated through drug court, which meant that the nightmares that I had been living no more had permission to be my master, but now had permission to be my teacher because I had learned those lessons and I was able to apply the lessons learned from the nightmares. And when my life got better, I had the gift to be able to assist other individuals who were still suffering for their lives to get better. Um, I just want to play that. That hopefully kind of reminds us why we're all here talking about drug courts. It is about the participants and the success drug courts have seen over the years. With uh, Chelsea and Robert, I guess a little over a year and a half ago, I had the pleasure of going to the White House uh, and having a meeting with uh, drug czar, um, U.S. Surgeon General. We ended up spending about uh, three hours in the West Wing um, in the Roosevelt Room discussing issues about drug courts, um, and they played a significant role. Um, both of those, uh, along with the other two graduates, were all pretty close to death prior to their involvement in treatment courts. So I think I, I just raise that with you as you see the success of where they are now. Uh, that's why we do this and have done it for a long time. What I want to do is just share with you a little about where I think drug courts have been in general. And then I know you're here with the two pending bills and there have a couple of suggestions at the request of the chairman, uh, maybe a couple of suggestions as it relates to uh, part of those bills. But just in general, as you look at these bills uh, and as they go forward, the drug court has changed over the years. One thing about drug courts, it has always been based upon the science. It's based upon the evidence. That's how decisions are made as to what, what we do and how we do it. And it's always changing. Um, and you know, how do we do it better? That was always the mantra in the courts I've been involved in is, is uh, most every week, how do we do this better? And I think that's the mantra of the organization is how do we do this better? Always looking at it and it has changed in the 30 years that has been in existence across this country. Uh, so one of the things that we've seen in the changes has been the trend where people first thought of drug courts as a diversionary court, and that's, that, was the, uh, that was the model early on. Now the trend across the country is it's more of a post-plea model. That's, that's the trend. Only about 15% of drug courts across the country are truly a diversionary model. The remainder have moved toward the post plea when you're, when you're looking at this. Now, and in these last 30 years, there are some uh, 4,000 treatment courts across the country, uh, 30,000 practitioners. Um, the National Association of Drug Court Professionals, we uh, were hoping to be in Anaheim this past summer. We had approximately 6,000 um, um, uh, individuals registered. But with COVID, we weren't able to do that. But amazingly, um, we ended up having almost 4,000 participate in a four-day virtual conference for training, which is pretty, pretty impressive uh, that the, uh, the staff was able to put that together. So we, we train. What The organization that I'm chairman of the board, we end up training um, the primary trainer across the country of individuals who are involved in, in drug courts. Um, what you're seeing now... And I've indicated to you that this change toward this post-plea version of, of drug courts, that seems to be the, the trend now. There's also, when you look at drug courts and how you get involved in drug courts, and I'll focus on a few things, is, again, the trends, diversion. You see a lot of probation cases and folks on probation who are participating in drug court, or then violation of probation and participating in drug court subsequent to the violation. Um, the interesting thing would be at some point, and I don't know the statistics, would, would be to look and see for our state, for example, how many people are in prison due to pro probation violations. Um, I think what we're looking at is, as we look at drug courts and probation violations is, again, what's the cause of the violation? Um, and if it is something that uh, clearly shows the need for uh, treatment, then that's what drug court is there for. Drug court is essentially for severe uh, addiction 
it is not intended to be for the first time offender. Um, I know all of you have been involved to some degree, I think, with drug courts, but just bring, bring that back to you that, that essentially it's not the first time offender. Solicitors have other alternatives available to them, public defenders, as far as alternatives available to them. Um, what we know from the people that we see involved in drug courts is that if they're not in drug courts, they're going to be involved in the system somewhere. Either they're going to be involved in uh, uh, the alternatives and probation or they're going to be in prison. We know they're going to be involved. Will they get to help to deal with the addiction is the issue. Um, but resources will be used. We know that drug courts are twice as successful or more than alternatives. Any other alternatives, twice as successful. There's a, um, so they work, they use less money. The, uh, Suggestion is, and I'll, I'll go through the bill, but just pointing out to you that there is different ways of looking at when drug courts should be considered. Again, it's moved to the post plea models, but um, again, probation violations is that's that's a, a, a more recent trend in, in years and a very successful trend as far as drug courts go. A few things what we've seen is um, with drug courts, we know it's the most successful intervention program um, in our history in the courts. Right now, there's probably, and I've given you some information that gives you a brief background. It references 150,000 uh, participants uh, annually go through drug courts across the country, and that number continues to grow. That's the, the good and the bad. There are alternatives available, but the bad news, it's, it's there. We, we know, I guess, that um, in South Carolina, I think it's probably two people die every day as a result of um, drug use. It gets closer to three I think when you throw in other drugs other than opioids, opioids being the primary source. The, um, we know that drug courts reduce crime. We know that it saves money. We know that it reunifies family because it treats everybody. It's, it involves the whole family in, in, um, in, in the drug court program. It ends up with lots of children being born without drugs in their system. Um, and I'll just mention sometimes you look at, you'll hear, and it's times when you probably research this or talk to folks about drug court. Sometimes they'll say, drug court, how long does it last? I wish I had the magic number. I've heard that over the years from different sides of the, of, of the issue, whether it be the prosecutor or defense lawyer. Just how long does it take? Well, it takes as long as it takes so that we help. Sometimes it takes a little longer. At times, you know, people have participated in drug court and uh, the end result and what we hope is is the baby's born uh, without drugs in the baby system. And so it ends up, uh, you want to make certain that, that when they walk out of the court, that they're in a position to make the right decisions and, and, uh, um, and are successful. So there's no particular time. There's a goal, and some will say a minimum of a year. Some will say that it could be done in less. Some think that it's, it could be or should be done in more time. Um, a few things about the bill that I would just point out to you that, um, and just looking at it, and again, these are sort of generic without offering. Uh, the, the best news in this for me, uh, having been involved with it, with as well as Judge Keasley, um, Judge Simmons and some others for a lot of years, uh, is that you all are looking at doing this. Uh, I think it is a positive step to continue to try to codify uh, drug courts and how they work uh, for lots of different reasons. Uh, and so uh, I hope that, that it will be successful as you continue and we'll offer our help in any way that we can and try to answer any questions that might help with that result. A few things in the bill, and some of this is just the change of the times. Again, there's reference in here as, as to using the um, 10 key components. Back in 1997, when some of the first research was done, that's how that was the, the basis for treatment and the considerations. Now, as, we, as I've in, indicated to you, we're, we're science-based, and so based on recent research in the last couple of years, um, those have been changed as to how we pursue it. There's reference to the 10 key components, but the better phrase would be, and I'd suggest uh, as you um, look at the uh, guidelines to be used in the courts for adult drug courts, the adult drug court best practice standards. Uh, they are working on juvenile court, juvenile drug court standards, and hopefully those will be ready, but the studies are still in process and the, the professor who's working with us on that, 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 that's coming. So we'll have more about juvenile drug courts and hopefully it will help us to uh, find more and better ways to, to work with young people. 
Um, another suggestion in looking at the bills in general, and I'll reference both of them, is the description regarding drug courts. Um, it, it talks about establishing drug courts. Well, you go some places and drug courts are just different. You, you go and, and say there's some places there's no defense lawyer there. Um, and um, that, that's concerning to me. Uh, so I would, I would say that drug courts consist of and would suggest uh, consideration for the, the uh, bills that there be maybe a broader definition which would include uh, it is a multidisciplinary team. It consists of the judge, defense counsel, the prosecutor, treatment providers, and law enforcement. In the 20 plus years of doing it, uh, when I went into staffing before drug courts, those people were all sitting at the table, uh, including um, probation representatives, were all sitting at the table discussing the participant, how they'd done that week, and helping make decisions. And so for drug courts to work, all those people need to be there. They can, it could work with, it could, but if you want it to work and work well, and you, you know, the more you know about the participant, the better off you are as the, as the judge in trying to make decisions and having all those people at the table who have a little different way of looking at or maybe an interest in the participant. The ultimate goal is the same, to be successful. We want, we want them to, to, uh, to be successful, to graduate from the program, and, and, and more than that is to stop drug use, and as to adults especially with uh, the drug use, is uh, that we save a life. That's ultimately, that's the ultimate objective. So I'd suggest the consideration of referencing drug courts and what they are. Uh, that the drug courts would consist of what I have mentioned to you to also include uh, probation, especially as it relates to adult drug courts. But the same has been true with juvenile courts, and I've done both over the years, primarily juvenile, but I was involved with the adult, adult drug court for about four years. All those are necessary ingredients. Um, for a, a successful drug court. The, uh, the other thing, it's drug courts are set up now through, uh, and, and again, some of this goes back to the history of when drug courts started in our state. It's being, um, not run by, but I guess the, through the, the solicitor's offices uh, back in, the, I can remember the meetings 20 plus years ago of talking about how to do this, and it was uh, with the solicitor's involvement, but with the places, it was solicitors and the, the public defenders primarily across the state who had some input into how this has come. But then the question was, how, um, with the money that would be received, how would that work? And that's where I think the directions took where the, the, the these money for this has come through the solicitor's offices and through the commission, but it was always, the rule was always to be used for drug courts, and that was the, 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 the reference to, or the, the limitation on what the money was used for. Um, and, and I'll try to answer any questions you have, but I, I guess I'm just trying to give you some general information about drug courts in the past, where we are, and the, as far as the bill itself, those were the, I, I think, the, the, uh, if you're an outsider looking in, I had sent this to our office, to NADCP, to look at, too. And I think the unusual thing for them is courts historically have been um, uh, controlled through the Supreme Court. That's, that's the body that makes the rules for us. But here, when it started, uh, it, it, it started differently, but the Chief Justice, Chief Justice Toll at the time, it ended up, this structure was adopted um, for, the, for drug courts in South Carolina, and we've made it, made it work. Uh, uh, but again, it's always good to look at and improve as evidenced by drug court in general. It's always looking to make things better and improvements and appreciate the suggestions and changes you all made in, in the bills that have been proposed. Um, Mr. Chairman, I'll be glad to try to answer any questions I can about any specifics that you're looking for, but that's, that's just kind of where I think drug courts in general across the country are going, and those are a few suggestions for the bill as to how you might consider a little more specificity with some items. All right, thank you. Uh, <clears throat> start over here, Mr. Hart. Any questions for Judge Williams? Thank you. <coughs> Ms. Representative Kimmons. I do have a question. Uh, 
Um, so right now we're running drug courts as a diversion, as a diversion program. So would it be um, your suggestion to run them as diversion programs and as part of sentencing? I think I saw that in the Georgia bill. Or would it be, um, because I think we're really limited on um, limiting ourselves by not allowing the judiciary to sentence someone to drug court in, in the cases where it's only a diversionary program in some circuits, and I know it is that way. My answer would be I think it is best to offer both. I'm not saying there's a right or a wrong, and across the country, that is what's so unique about this. We've got 50 states. They're all a little bit different. You can look at the Georgia bill. You know, I can other places how how it's run, diversion, or but just in general, the trend has been where now only approximately 15% are diversion programs, 85% are post plea, but at the same time, some could be uh, both in a sense. Um, that's that's the thing. Nice thing about drug courts right. is the solicitors and the public defenders can be creative enough if they would like to make it work either one, and that, that's so I think it's. It should be, and you know, I mentioned probation violations. Clearly, that's not, you, at that point you're not looking at diversion, right. and that is a big part of what drug courts have become over the years. Is that um, with different sentencing, we've we've lessened the sentence in some places around the country. Well, what that has done is um, it has given people an opportunity to be on probation, but they didn't actually get the help they needed, so they're back in court. Right. And again, we're going to keep them in the system. So we keep doing the same thing, or we try something new, drug courts. So the question is, you know, sometimes it may be given the one chance, and it's come back, come back on a probation violation, and drug court's the alternative. Maybe it's the third chance, but it is an alternative where the judge can sentence. Historically, it's always been the idea of someone consenting to participating in drug court. Right. And certainly in a diversion program, that, that's the case. But on the other, end, the other side to that, I would agree with you, would be, there are opportunities for post-plea versions, non-diversion programs that as part of the judge's sentence, it's another tool available, uh, something available for the judge to, uh, again, treat the person, treat the family, treat all the things that for some reason regular probation didn't work. Right. Um, so I think that's a, a good opportunity and a good option to have available, yes. Thank you. Representative Stavernakis. Judge, let me ask you a couple questions. I know <clears throat> we talked about this um, before, and I want to make sure that I understood what you just stated. South Carolina, 85% of drug court is post plea? No, I'm saying nationally that's nationally, the trend. Nationally, okay. Nationally that's the trend. In, in the Do you have any state, idea what it, what it would be? I, I, I don't. I started making phone calls last week and had a great opportunity to talk to Whoever I found that was available in their offices about talk about drug courts and how things were going during COVID, but I couldn't tell you the exact numbers of uh, that part. I didn't get into. I was just curious how what, what they were doing and and uh, so started do you, calling. Do you find? And I think this would probably be a question too that uh, for Solicitor Stone and um, Mr. Pennington, but if if the if somebody is referred pre-plea, then the court, the case still stays active on the court administration docket or records, correct? As far as... That's my understanding. Yes, sir. And I think that's one of the reasons um, that some places... Like to do it post-plea. Versus post-plea. Yes, sir. Because post-plea takes the, takes the case off of, off of your numbers, I guess, wherever that court administration consistently monitors, correct? Or yes, sir, but I can't say that's true of every place in the country. Right. As far as why they've moved toward a post plea versus diversion programs. But it's certainly that's one of the issues. In South Carolina. My understanding in South Carolina, that's one of the issues that caused some to move from the, the pre-plea versions to post-plea uh, versions of the program was because of, of, and there's pros and cons to both sides uh, of it, but one, one is it resolves the case and that is sitting there. The negative side to to that is the trial judge may have less, um, well, maybe it's already, the sentence has already occurred 
and there's no option to go back and see why the person failed, see where that person is, say, nine months later, is, would the same sentence be appropriate nine months later with what they've accomplished in drug court? I mean, they didn't graduate, but, you know, what's their status? So there's, there's pros and cons to both as to how it is, uh, which, which particular method is, is the best. And then the, as far as the selection uh, and, uh, of drug courts, that is up to the individual circuit, how they appoint the, the drug court judge, correct? Is it, is There's no rule in place other than the Chief Justice has to ultimately sign the appropriate order to to appoint, to the, appoint them, giving them the authority to preside over the court. Okay. So but as far as, the, I guess, the recommendation, that tends to come from the solicitor's office, the public defender's office, or and, is there and, a combination? And, Do you know? And I, my, my ex, I don't. That's one of those that I've that, uh, not taken a survey of the courts in South Carolina or drug courts to see how the judge is appointed, um, whether it was a, the conversation between the prosecutor and defense lawyer, the, the public defender, to come up with someone to make a recommendation to the court or primarily from the prosecutor. Um, I, I don't know the answer. And then I think just you said um, there are good things in the bill. There's, or there's good things the way we run it. There are some things that we could probably improve on. Uh, when you look at the, as you've studied the different drug courts throughout the, the country on a, you know, how, how do we fare as far as up against uh, other other states. Yeah, what we do for the most part, we do well. But like everything else and every other uh, alternative available, is it goes back to how much money do you have to provide services for uh, for the participants. I think what we do we do well when our staff and ADCP comes down and trains. That I think they're amazed at what we do with the resources that we have. We have a lot of wonderful success stories in South Carolina from drug courts. But at the same time, like I said, if if um, I think there are improvements to be made, like I said, as far as the multidisciplinary team and how having everyone engaged, and that be part of the statute to make certain that sitting at the table is, is a defense lawyer or the public defender each week. Um, uh, that, that's just a necessary person. I, over, over the years of doing it, that, that was one of those for me, was that was just something that I had to have um, in the court, courtroom and in staffing was defense counsel. Um, and a public defender representing those, and then it, when necessary, they could call private counsel. If private counsel was still involved, um, if, if I needed private counsel who was still helping with the person to get them there. But that's just one of those, all those folks need to be at the table. Um, the services you can provide, and you all are always here, uh, it's, it's, it's about uh, the needs, the money necessary, but the needs in Columbia are different, say, from the needs in, in Charleston because of the, the, even the size and, and the, not only the size of the county, but just how the county is laid out as, as to transportation, people with ability to get and participate in drug courts, which you have now of multiple, multiple counties with uh, Solicitor Stone, for example. He's got five counties in his circuit, now some very rural areas. Again, do you fund one? Do you fund all five? And the bills is reference to a presence in the counties. And there's, you know, with technology, there's new ways to maybe to do that. But it's still going to cost to, to right. provide those services. So um, you, you need um, all those things are beneficial for a successful drug court. And, and resources, you, you answer my question, resources is, is basically more money. I mean, it's, it comes down to typically on, on programs like this or is, is a funding issue. It's, it's a funding issue. And again, uh, practical experience of being involved with, with drug courts, um, most participants who were in the courts didn't have a lot of money. Had some the participants who were involved in drug court who had money and could afford some things and options, but most didn't. So our challenge was always to come up, especially with transportation, to get them there. But um, um, so that, that's, that's a huge issue depending on where you are. Again, the, the, the part you have about having a presence in the other counties, uh, and you compare that to say a Ridgeland and Kershaw versus a Beaufort and the surrounding counties. 
or Charleston and, and other counties surrounding that may make up the circuit and, and looking at how you provide the services to those people. Uh, and again, knowing with limitations with income, transportation, that's a huge part of this because uh, one thing we've learned though, because of COVID has been the success of virtual courts. Uh, the judge that was the prior chairman of our association I talked to him. He would be the equivalent probably to a circuit judge in our state. What he does now is he runs five drug courts. Uh, so every day he's been sitting at his home. It, when I've talked to him via Zoom, it's a nice view out the back window when he turns his camera that way. But he's, he has been virtually holding drug court with the participant in their homes. What he's learned, though, is he's, he knows so much more about them now because he saw them in their homes. It's right. that, it's, that's that kind of... Relate, and that's one thing about drug courts is the judge. You, you, you want to have a relationship with a participant that, that you know them and they, you hope they get to know you enough to help make good decisions from, from the judge's perspective. And uh, so I think there are some alternatives to uh, help with some of this with cost. We've learned as a result of this, this terrible time we're going through right now. But um, still, uh, in person, I think it's still the best. But I think we have some alternatives that might be available at times, but still with treatment providers and, and what they do and, and counseling, that, that's uh, all those things being done. The, the, yes, so there's a cost to it. The good news is, and I go back to the cost, every study that's been done, this is less than incarceration. It is less than other alternatives, uh, and it is more successful than other alternatives. That's the bottom line. It is more successful, costs less. Um, I agree with you on the uh, on the WebEx. I mean, there's certain things that you need to do in person in a court, jury trials and, and certain hearings. But uh, if there is a silver lining as far as COVID, I think we've technology we're going to see as we go forward with or without COVID more um, as far as judicial economy, things being done via WebEx. Um, right. And WebEx doesn't work if it happens to be. And, you know, this is an accountability court. It's a treatment court, right. but it's an accountability court, uh, which makes it different now. That makes it a little harder that if they're via WebEx. Uh, hopefully, they'll go turn themselves in if that's the count. But it may be that they're going to have to have in-person uh, court the next time or something. There's other ways, I guess, to handle all those things. It doesn't always handle all circumstances. But it, it does. If one thing that it was um, Judge Brace is the judge I'm thinking of or uh, – and talking to Carson Fox, we have, you know, Carson used to be prosecutor here in South Carolina, worked for Solicitor Myers, and now is the uh, CEO of the National Drug Court Association. What we have seen nationally from participants in drug court, it is not participants trying to get away from it. This is their lifeline. It's amazing how many are doing more because they don't want to lose this because depending on the drug, clearly, but this is their lifeline. It is the difference between life and death, and I think they see it. And that's been the observation from what we've seen across the country, is having this treatment available, being creative with how we do it during this time, but it is not wanting to get away from it. I can cut back because I'm not around. It is they know this is what is, what is there for them and their family, and it's them reaching and holding on during very difficult times. And... Um Regarding resources, are there federal grants out there, and have we taken advantage of, if there are, that, you, that you're aware of? That there, would are, there are grants, and we have, and we were just talking. I think the, um, both Charleston and I, and I know Buford just got uh, notice in, in, in Richland County. Uh, as, as I said, up in 20, Richland County, we, we're going to restart the juvenile drug court. We had some changes in our drug court, and I guess about a year ago stopped, but we're going to reboot the juvenile drug court and uh, just received um, a, a two-year grant. So there are grants in the Department of Justice and others to, to help with drug courts. It's, and it, it's, uh, it's, you're competing. It's a process, how, how well you write and request grants. But yes, so there, there are some. Some are court, for courts already in existence, like for the juvenile court that we're doing. It was either going to be for new courts or those rebooting, and that's what we were sort of applied for based on the fact we wanted to And is that the individual again. circuit or county that does that? It was the individual court uh, applying, and this was done through 
Richland County Solicitor's Office, and that's what I think was done with the other grants as well. Um, so, I mean, conceivably, you could have, like, in South Carolina, you could have 16 circuits uh, competing for one federal well, it depends dollars. on the I'm, I'm just because wondering because I know the $150 fee goes to the prosecution commission for them to then allocate back, uh, you know, according to the end of the bill. I mean, I'm just wondering, is there way, is there some better way to uh, pool our money? Well, I, I Would think, we get I bigger think, bang for the buck? Well, go back to the first part. We could be competing for the one grant, but... For example, Ohio, when I was looking at the grant list, they had about 12 of them. Um, in South Carolina, we were fortunate enough to get three. Again, it depends on what's being offered and, and the, the um, and again, the grant writers and the needs and what's there. As far as the money being available, um, it, it needs to be used for the courts as to where it goes. Um, that's always been with this, this structure from the beginning. When the money came in, it was to be used for the courts. That, that it was, um, at, the, at the time, it did not go to the judicial department. The, I think the, and again, the decisions were made that it would be set up in the structure that you see before you now. But ultimately, uh, it is to be used for drug courts as to how it's used, as you all are the first to go and start looking at how it ought to be used and to, to pinpoint um, specific needs and where it should be used. and a little more oversight of the money um, is what I see in the bill. Um, before, it, it was, um, it, that's the first, but that was, the decision was made, like I said, a lot of years ago, not, not my decision uh, to be made, but that's how the structure was set up at the time. Uh, but certainly, um, is as long as it's used for drug courts. And I guess then, in some states, you'll see bills that, Money's control through the, the court system or through the Supreme Court because they set the rules and a structure is set up that way. Some places just don't do it because they're local entities. They're public elections for judges. They have just a whole different setup. It's all local monies, local um, fees paying for it versus a statewide program. Uh, money's being available. So they're all a little bit different. Um, I wish I could give you, give you the... the uh, is, is as far as the system that we have here, if it's going to be um, used for drug, um, if it is continuing the process now, as long as it's used for drug courts, but at the same time, that needs to be for treatment. And one of the questions I've always, you know, I would have was it used for? Uh, I need, I need when I'm doing drug courts, I'm looking for a public defender and I'm looking for a prosecutor sitting in the in staffing with me and sitting in the courtroom. So it is, as long as it's used for drug courts, um, that's if, how, that, how that money is used in various programs, I don't know. If any of it's used uh, to complement um, staffing as far as the lawyers, don't know. Again, that's one thing as the judge. I did my role as a judge. I wasn't involved in the, the funding of the process. That was, uh, as you said, as you see, the money didn't come through us. The, it was just to be used for for drug courts, and so I've never, I wish I could give you more information about the money, but that's something I'm, I'm kind of glad. I never was involved in the money, per se, other than it paid for the services. If I had the services I wanted for the young people there in my courts, that's what I was looking for. If I needed transportation, if I needed whatever I needed for those kids, that's what I'm looking for is the money to be there to be used for those things. At the same time, it was used for training because, as you see, uh, this is about having experts treat people with very difficult problems. So it was used for training and getting people to uh, the NADC conference or a statewide conference that we would have to be trained to do this the right way um, because it is uh, some outstanding experts who know how to care for people with substance uh, use disorders um, that, that are involved with them. All right. Any... All right, thank you, Judge Williams. Sure, thank you. Excuse me. Next, we will hear from um, Solicitor Duffy Stone. Thank you for coming again, Solicitor.
Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, members, thank you for having me. I appreciate it. First of all, Judge Williams, I've considered him to be the foremost South Carolina expert in drug courts, and I've, I've worked with him on the national scale as well as the state's level. And um, I, I agree, obviously, with everything he said, and I think that uh, he is a great resource, and I, and I congratulate this committee for asking him to speak. Um, let me just tell you from my perspective, and I think I can answer a number of your questions earlier, but I'm, I'm certainly fr feel free to ask me whatever or interrupt me, but I think you've hit on two things that are, that are particularly crucial here. Um, I don't think I need to sell you at this point for the purpose of drug court or how good it is or how useful it is. I think not only is it, uh, not only is it cheaper than incarceration, uh, financially it makes sense. But it makes sense on another financial level as well, as well as a public safety level, which is it works. Uh, recidivism to me is the only way that you can actually save money in the criminal justice system. Crime is expensive. We look at how much it costs to put somebody in prison and we say, wow, that's expensive. We look at drug courts and say, well, it may cost money for us to, to do that. Well, that costs money too. What else costs money is victimization. That's a real cost that it gets handed down to the citizens if we don't cure the problem that we're facing at the criminal justice system. To answer one of uh, Judge Williams' questions earlier, uh, how many people have been on probation or violated probation? The only thing I can tell you is that during the COVID, um, when COVID first hit, we went in and studied, we had some time um, not being in court, and we studied 2,600 defendants that came through the Buford County system. Uh, through, my four, through the 14th Circuit. And of those 2,600 defendants, 2,000 of them had been, uh, had been arrested before. Uh, that's not a particularly good success rate. And each time when these people are coming back, they're coming into General Sessions Court, they're hurting somebody else. There is a cost to hospitalizations. There's a cost to counseling. There's a cost to sexual assault exams. There's a cost to funerals. So those costs, I think we have to look at when we're looking at this. And the thing about drug court and what I like about it is that it reduces all of those costs because it re reduces recidivism. And that's why I like this program so much. And when I, when I was asked um, by the speaker to address you as a whole committee, uh, one of my recommendations was in part of recommendation number seven was to fund drug court. So, here, here is, unfortunately, what I see as the downside or the difficult nature, not a downside of drug court, but the difficult nature of getting people into drug court. First is, are the resources. And, and I recognize you're not ways and means, but you're sitting under the seal of South Carolina, which has two mottos. One is, while I breathe, I hope, but the other one is, prepared in mind and resources. We have to be prepared on these resources. Resources are an issue at every level, and we have to face that. Right now, the resources that are given to the state, not just because fines and fees are down, which they obviously are because we're not having court and we don't bring in any fines and fees. Um, the fines and fees are down, but they have been on a downward trajectory for a while. This is not anything particularly new. That's a major funding source for drug courts throughout the state. My circuit, and I'll give you some real numbers on this, my circuit gets $100,000 roughly from the state of South Carolina for drug court. I have five counties stretching over 3,700 square miles. I have one very wealthy county in Buford County, and I have four very poor counties in Jasper, Allendale, Hampton, and Colleton. Um, it cost $188,000 in the last fiscal year to run my drug court. Now, my drug court is a multidisciplinary court, so that includes veterans courts, veterans court, domestic violence court, drug court, mental health, anything that we can, what we basically do is try to figure out what is the problem, what is the underlying issue with this particular offender, and then send them into the treatment area that they need. And if that's alcohol and drugs, fine. If it's mental health, that's fine. If it's a veteran, we have the use of the Veterans Administrations. $188,000 pays for the director. It pays for the uh, drug testing equipment. It pays for an en enforcement officer who goes to the houses on weekends and makes sure that they're testing, testing negative on their, um, on their drug screens. It goes to paying for the judges that we have that come, and we pay them $100 an hour, and they come and they have, uh, they have court once a week. Um, it does not pay for drug treatment. It does not pay for the treatment component of that. And by the way, that's adult and juvenile. I wasn't clear about that, but that's running both adult and juvenile throughout the spectrum of those, of those programs. Um, 
Buford County Alcohol and Drug was providing an in-kind contribution for alcohol and drug treatment. However, you gave me a hundred, you know, the state gives me a hundred thousand dollars. It costs 188,000. Hilton Head contributes $50,000 out of their town money to run the drug, drug, drug court program and the veterans court program. 50,000 there. We get roughly $20,000 max. And, and that's if we're lucky from the participants. So that gives you some concept of the resources. And here's, here's why that fails. And here's why that's a problem for me. Uh, I'm not the solicitor for just Buford County. I have some very poor people that can't afford it. I've got, Allendale's not going to, I can go to Allendale County Council and I can beg them for money until the cows come home. They don't have it. They're suffering under over 30% poverty in this state. And South Carolina is averaging right now, I think 14% poverty. Jasper doesn't have it. I just got one of those federal grants and I got the grant is actually to expand our drug and alcohol and veterans court program into Colleton County and Jasper County. Um, that will take a care of about 90% of our docket, but we still don't have the money to get out into those outlying areas. What we're gonna do with that money is we're gonna hire a drug treatment person and a mental health person, because that's been one of the components that we've had a really difficult time getting. Um, and we are gonna put them on the road. They're going to go to the participants. Yes, sir. So, so the hundred thousand dollar and the well, the multidisciplinary. I call almost like a diversion court. You know, because you, you bring in veterans. Sure. Domestic violence. I think you said, drug and alcohol offenders. Yes, sir. That is just what you're talking about. That is just for Beaufort County. That's correct. Because Hilton Head contributes fifty thousand dollars, I can't export it. Right. That's what I was going to ask you. Yes, sir. Okay. I mean, I, so that, and that's the problem. And that's been the problem that we've had. We have, and I think if you look throughout the state and I've talked to other solicitors, that's what you're seeing. The money is not enough to, 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 to pay for it on its own. Therefore, somebody else has got to fund it. You've got a good point with federal grants. Yes, there would be 16 solicitors fighting over the same, the same pot of money. I'm not sure that's not something that could be successful. We were successful in getting this grant and we just got it yesterday. But we've been working on it for a couple of years, too. Um, something's got to prop up the finances of that. It costs $188,000. We do not, we're not, I don't feel like we're wasting that money. Um, the problem is, if I don't have Hilton Head to prop it up, and if I didn't have the Buford County alcohol and drug to, to, to cover the treatment, I couldn't do it at all. I would have $100,000 that you would give me, and I'd have to put it in the bank and just leave it there or give it back. So, I mean, it, to me, I think that resources are, are, are particularly crucial and particularly crucial in the poor areas of our state because many, many more of our counties fall under, fall over that poverty line with higher poverty than under it. And so I think if you look at that at an average poverty of 14, every circuit in South Carolina has at least one, in some cases, in my case, four counties that have higher poverty than the state average. So to me, and what we have proposed from the prosecution commission this year, two, two ways and means we're going to, we haven't done the presentation yet, obviously, but is for $175,000 to go to each circuit. Uh, and in particular, so that they can cover on top of the fines and fees so they can get these, get these programs out into some of my, our, our poor areas. Which is, which is, in my mind, what I think I am seeing throughout the state. The wealthy counties have it, the poor counties don't. The wealthy counties can afford it, and the poorest don't. So, uh, Solicitor Stone, that 100000 that you referenced, that was uh, the money that was collected statewide that was then transport, uh, transferred back to uh, your circuit? Yes, that's correct. Okay. That's, I, uh, and then y'all were requesting another 175 per circuit. That's right. So, uh, I guess... Your whatever money you collect, fines and fees, divided between the 16 circuits, and then on top of that, an additional 175 right. per circuit. Because we did, that's right. Yes, sir. And Yes, sir. And we've had, obviously, and I think everyone has, obviously, with the court stopping, the fines and fees dried up for the last quarter of the first, uh, of last fiscal year uh, and the first quarter of this fiscal year. So we've had a loss there as well, and that's down. But I think if you look at fines and fees throughout, I think you've seen a sort of a lower trajectory on that. Um, but again, let's assume for a second you're putting that type of money. Imagine the amount of money that you're actually saving for, for again, for the prison costs. But 
but I don't want to get too far away from this main point because what Judge Williams said, I think, is exactly right. These are accountability courts. They are providing treatment that people need, whether those are veterans who came and, and served our country and suffered from mental illnesses that they didn't leave with, whether it's a drug and alcohol, somebody that's addicted to drugs and alcohol, whether it's a mental health issue, wh whatever it might be, giving them that treatment is important, but it's also holding them accountable and it's holding them accountable not only to go through that treatment, but to get them into the program. And that's the second pro problem that, that I'm seeing throughout the state. When I proposed in my book earlier uh, the funding of drug court, it wasn't just the funding of drug court because there's another component of it. Right now, drug court's hard. Uh, if you look at what you have to do for drug court and if you look at the national standard, and this is ever since the drug courts were invented in 1989 in Dade County. And when they were invented there, there was constant intervention with these with participants. The participants had to go, go to court on a regular basis. They constantly were dealing with, with the drug and alcohol treatment people. They were dealing with people who were enforcing it and making sure that they were getting the treatment that, that they weren't testing positive. This is hard. Drug court's hard, it's not easy. And you have to wanna to do it. Um, the problem is they don't wanna do it right now. Uh, we have, we, we do not, I think it's underutilized. You wanna talk about a percentage, um, the Pareto principle, which is the 80-20 rule, I think exists in the criminal justice system. 20% of the people are responsible for 80% of the problems. If you, I've had a career criminal prosecution unit since 2010. If you look at my docket today, somewhere between 10 and 15% of our people that come in are sent to that career criminal prosecution unit. Another probably 20% fall under the I've never been arrested again before and I probably will never be arrested again category. And those are going to pretrial intervention or they're getting conditional discharges. They're getting a whole myriad of other, other options. That leaves a pretty large percentage of people to deal with. And I don't know what the, the what probation's recidivism rate is, but I know what ours is. I know what our pretrial intervention recidivism rate is. It's an 84% success rate. Drug court is harder, and it's a 70% success rate. That is probably standard throughout the state, although I don't know. But those are hand-counted numbers. I promise you those are right. Um, last year, it dropped a percentage point. It was 69%, just to make sure that, that I'm telling you. That I'm they, no, sir. They've got. They, they. They have to be. They have to go to the drug and alcohol. They have, and but that's the problem. The problem is, is that too, we're having a very difficult time in my circuit, and from every from what I've talked to, and I talked to the solicitors again yesterday, and we're seeing it throughout. It's so hard. There's no fear of the other end. In other words, what what is the motivation that gets them into the program to begin with? And here's the, here's the cold, hard truth to this. Nobody's knocking on my door saying, look, I don't have any criminal charges pending, and uh, I, I just really want to go through your program. Nobody's doing that. They're coming into my program because I have something over their head that says, if you don't do what, what you're going to do, then there is a legitimate consequence on the end of that. And you go back to 1989 when they created these things in, in, in Dade County, that was actually considered as let's, let's put them in, let's plead them in, but the defendant has the choice. Do you want to go through this program and get the treatment or do you want to face, face, face uh, consequences in the criminal justice system? And right now those consequences are not tough enough for them to want to be in our programs. That's all there is to it. I'm not suggesting that you amp up the sentences. I'm not suggesting that you, you know, that we start saying, well, we need to get really tough on, on crime. But part of my recommendation was, and continues to be truth in sentencing, that whatever sentence a judge gives somebody, that they have to serve 85% of it. That doesn't mean, and, and in fact, Mr. Chairman, you asked me a very pointed question last time I was here, which is, would that do away with the need for minimum mandatory sentences? My answer for the 14th Circuit solicitor is, yes, I think it would. I don't, I don't, I understand the need and the desire to get away from minimum mandatory sentencing on drug offenses, but there has got to be enough um, motivation to get these people into the program. They will not strictly go out and do it on their own. They're not going to come volunteer for this. They're not going to, and I've offered, I'm not even offering uh, getting away from prison time. I've offered doing away with their conviction totally, expunging their record. 
and I still can't get the numbers that I need to be getting. We are going to have probably about 20, maybe, that come through our system, that, that come through our drug court programs this year. And we have 2,500 warrants. That's a lot of people. Again, you're talking about 60 to 65 percent of the people that we could be trying to divert into that program and getting them in, but we need to have that. So well, my suggestion in category number seven was, yes, you do need to fund drug corps. Yes, I think there are some other ways we can figure out how to do it. Federal grants now, quite frankly, that's going to put me in a totally different position than I was in this time last year. Everybody doesn't have that opportunity. But uh, transportation is an issue. We're going to have to we're going to have to take the drug court to them. We can't expect people in poor areas just to drive to Beaufort County, even if Beaufort County alcohol and drug would give them the treatment, which I wouldn't imagine they would. Um, but I think we all the other second segment of that has to be get a Senate structure that makes sure that these people look up and say, look, I, there's a real consequence if I don't do this program, if I'll, I'll take advantage of it. Because I know, at least from my standpoint, I want more people. I, to me, 20 is nowhere near the number I want. No, it's 20 total. I wish it was 20 percent. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Black yes, sir. What I've seen up here happen since I've been here is that all too often logic is making sure that we can also sort of end it off in the name of caution. Because what happens is it's we're being soft on crime. But also Thank you. Representative Stavernakis. Solicitor, thank you for being here again and for presenting to us and 
given us your thoughts on on so many different issues. Um, talk to me about the equity side of this, though. I mean, um, I think all of us up here are convinced in terms of a justice reform measure that drug court is a good thing. Um, but, you know, you mentioned... I think you said you only got 20 people going through the program and I mean, hundred thousand dollars, 20 people, that's not enough people. Nope. Um, so what are the standards in your office for who gets an invitation to drug court? Um, and I have concerns about how that process works from county to county and circuit to circuit. So if you could talk to me about what you do in your circuit. Well, <clears throat> excuse me, primarily going back to what Representative Hart said, uh, I let the people that know what they're talking about make the decision. We have, um, we have two very highly trained and they've gone to just about every uh, um, uh, drug court training there's, there is and there has been. Um, trying to determine how you can identify those people who are suffering from an alcohol or drug dependency. Here, here's the problem. If you take out, we spend a good bit of our resources in our office in intake, determining where, what, what happens to people, who are the people we're dealing with. And let, let me get back a little bit, too, to what uh, Representative Hart said, too, that I think this, this is important. I think the biggest mistake we've made in the criminal justice system over the past 20 years is we're focused just on the crime and not on the person who is... Who is who, who is the offender. And, and that's to me, is real. I mean, I hear people on a regular basis saying, I'm going to get tough on fill-in-the-blank crime. And it's actually not about the crime. It's about the people underlying the crime because there are, this is, unfortunately, it works both ways. This is why the whole violent, nonviolent thing doesn't necessarily work. You're not talking about the crime itself. You need to be talking about the people. And so what we spend a good bit of our resources on are identifying who their people are that are coming through our system. Are they people who are likely never to commit another crime? Then let's get them, send them to PTI, send them to uh, 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 some type of conditional, do something other than run them through the court system. Are these people who are the people who I described earlier as those who embrace crime? Are they going to, and it doesn't matter what they've gotten arrested for. If, if they are going to get out of jail and go commit another crime and they're going to do that on a repeat of ba basis, those are career criminals. They need to go to the other side of the office, which is our career criminal team. After that, it's what's motivating this person? What, what's, the, what's the underlying issue? And it's shocking to me that all you do is if you can identify it, and, and Michael Lee, who is, who's been my director for, for years and has gone through all types of training, says you can actually... You can actually tell it um, by reading the incident report and their criminal history. I don't know how he does that, but he does. And he's identifying people. He wants people in his program. We want people in the program. So, and, so but let me, let me, but yeah. in your office, are there certain charges where you're not getting considered for drug court? I don't care. We're not even, we're not even looking at you. Sure. Murder, armed robbery, rape. Uh, child molestation, yes. I mean, there are some like that, and that's that's those go yeah. without saying. But, I mean, but right, none, none but of us, take none of us are, are saying that's 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 a suitable crime for drug court. Um, but some burglaries, right. things like that. Sure. A lot of times, these yes. are crimes that are a result of addiction um, and people uh, engaging in in uh, behavior they might not otherwise engage in but to go get money to go buy drugs to satisfy a terrible addiction. Um, those kinds of crimes, yes. are they, we have are they banned in, in your office, regardless of whether they're under subsection B or A under the BERG? Right. So you would, let, you would consider those in your office? And we have. Okay. Well, that's good to hear. It's not true everywhere. Um, now, I'll have to say, like, like I, you know, I'm not, I'm not following you on the truth and sentencing thing. I think we have it where we need it. You mentioned those kinds of crimes, and I think we have it where we need it. I think it going that direction on these other crimes, and if you, if you did it across the board on everything, mm -hmm. is going backwards to a system that we've established doesn't really work. Um, and, and we need to be doing more of the opposite, finding uh, options like this that work for people um, 
this one isn't going to work for everybody, though. As you as you mentioned, there's a lot of people that just don't qualify for this. They don't have a an, an addiction problem. They may have they may have other problems um, that are that are leading uh, to criminal behavior, and there may be other kinds of uh, rehabilitation um, that work for them that don't include this. And to me, if we if we just create this system where here's the number and here's how long you're gone, then we have totally given up in that scenario in, in hopes of creating a real uh, effective system of rehabilitation within the Department of Probation, Parole, Pardon Services, and even in some instances in the Department of Corrections. And I don't wanna go there. I mean, I, I think we, we went down that road and it just, uh, you know, Again, there's some people we've got to put in jail and they got to stay there a long time, maybe forever. And, and I think all of us acknowledge that, but there's a whole huge group of people um, that that's not true for, but that they're in the criminal justice system for a reason and we've got to find the right fix um, and punishment for them and for society moving forward. And I just, I'm not, I'm not sold on sentencing reform across the board as, you know, 85% is going to fix that problem for us. Um, the stick, as you and Representative Hart talked about, doesn't work in a lot of cases in the criminal justice system. It just doesn't. I mean, it might get someone a sentence, but in many cases, you're you're when that sentence is over, you're putting a person back on the streets who is not in position to be a better citizen. And, and, and that's, just, that's just, we need to focus on that part of it, um, in my opinion. This is part of that, a good part. Um, and, and to be honest, you know, we have offenses that are in that 85% category now that don't belong there. Um, we have offenses in the violent crime section that don't belong there. We probably have some that aren't there that should be. Um, and I'm hopeful that that's the kind of thing we need to get at. Get at. Um, Back to my original question, you're, what you're doing in your circuit, not every circuit is doing. And that equity side is important. Um, creating those opportunities, not just saying, well, because this charge is in this classification, you can't go to drug court. Um, I don't think that's helpful, to be honest, and I don't think it's equitable. Um, so I think this committee has to grapple with some of that. And so any suggestions you have on how to how to deal with that statutorily would be welcome. Um, and then the, other, the last thing is for indigent folks, how do you, how do you handle that? So you've, you've got a person that meets the profile. They don't have the $150. Right. Um, <coughs> how do y'all handle that as a general assembly? Would we be better off spending some of our money in that area or providing more staff. I mean, yeah, I'd like to actually take the finances out of it. The problem is you, you, right now somebody's got to pay for it. Um, we don't charge 150, we charge 100, uh, which I think is actually cheaper there. At least it was at one time cheaper than probation costs. I think I pulled um, the 150 out of the bill. So It is, it, yeah. you're right. Uh, but that's not, I just want the, the other end of that though is that um, we collect it at drug court, they come in, they pay a little at a time and they continue to pay. And from what I understand from, from the people that are much smarter about this than I am, it gives that offender buy-in. It, it literally gives them some feeling that they, they've got something at stake too uh, and that they're actually more involved in the process. Again, would it be something that I think we, I'd like to be able to take the money out of it totally? Absolutely. Um, when we, when we analyze the defendants and we try to figure out who needs to go into a drug court program, who gets offered it, we don't look at whether or not they can afford to pay for it or not. Uh, that doesn't factor in. Um, but again, but if they that's can't not pay, what's If they though. can't pay, do they still go in or yes. not? Yeah. They do? They do. Now, I, okay. I, I don't follow along to see how much they actually collect from people and how much they don't collect from people. But I cannot remember a time in which anybody was thrown out of our drug court program because they didn't pay. Um, it, it's, you know, I, I don't know, you know, I think the problem is this. I don't think it's me that's not keeping people out of, out of drug court. I don't, I think, I quite frankly, I think it's the defendant that doesn't want to be in there because it's too hard. 
And I think if we get away from that too much, I think you've got you've got an interesting perspective. And you and I, uh, I, I know we have not spent a lot of time together talking about this. Um, I find it interesting uh, that in 2011 in Los Angeles, the murder rate was they had 297 murders in Los Angeles. In 1994, they had a thousand. And there was actually an NPR article on it uh, concerning and, and interviewing a number of people that said, you know, what caused the massive drop? I mean, from 1994 all the way to 2011, that's a pretty massive drop. And a professor at the University of California, Los Angeles, actually said, well, it's four different factors. Better policing, better community relations, tougher sentences, and more prisons. Now, those two of those don't go with the other two. But the point is, is that if you look at the trajectory of crime all the way back to the 1960s, not only in this country, but in South Carolina, you'll see that it was up, up until about 1993, somewhere in the early 1990s, and then it started a downward trajectory. And two things happened. So the question's got to be, and I don't care what trajectory you look at, if it's violent crime, nonviolent crime, overall crime, you'll see that same trajectory that sometime in the early 90s, all of a sudden it started going down. And there were two things that were happening at the exact same time. 1989, they start the drug court program right in the middle of the crack epidemic, right in the middle of the war on drugs. But they also started the two strikes, three strikes laws in 1993 in Washington. And after that, 10 more states in 94, 10 more states in 95, in South Carolina in 1996. And what that's doing is that is giving that other end of the equation. I simply do not believe that the criminal drug court works because of two factors. You're giving them treatment, but you're also holding them accountable. That's how the criminal justice system has to work, too, or it's not going to work. You can't just do it on one end. And so I, I understand your perspective. I agree with you completely, and I, and I acknowledge off the top there are classes of offenses where that stuff is necessary, and we're not, we're not going to change it. Um, and, and Whether it's 85 percent or two strikes, three strikes, or or uh, violent designation, sure. all those things are important for certain classes of offenses and offenders, and and keep the community safe. I mean, I, I agree with you. The prop. I think the difference that I have is this: uh, I don't believe the violent, nonviolent things do matter. I don't think the labels matter. I think we're not dealing with the crime, we're dealing with the criminals. And I think that in that context, the only person that actually has the best access to those people, and with an not only with a prosecutor in the same room, with a defense attorney that's representing them, and family members, and everybody else involved, is the judge. And so when the judge says, you need to have a sentence of X, and I don't care if it's 18 months, I don't care if it's six months, I don't care if it, it doesn't matter to me the amount of time, I think what we have done in not only this statement, a number of them, is we have relied heavily on the labels. And we're going to call a crime a certain crime and we're going to treat it a different way. It's not about the crime, it's about the criminal, it's about the offender. What is driving this person? And, and what, how, how do you deal with that? And if there's a judge in the courtroom that sees a Tyrone Robinson who's been there on nonviolent offenses over and over and over again and says, you're dangerous, but he still can't give him a sentence, then I think there's a problem with that. So well, I think just here's what I would say to that. Different. So going down that going down that road is a discussion worth having, but it honestly would require a rewrite of almost all of our statutory penalties. I mean, it, it just would. I mean, we've got I mean, a gram of cocaine is up to 15 years in jail. I mean, so you can't you can't take that framework and try to make what you're talking about work. Is there a framework where what you're talking about works? Yes. And would, would there, is there a framework where that's a better system? I think there is, but not what, with what we have now. And, that, and, that, and that's my point. And if, if we want to sit down and do that work, I'm, yep. I'm with you. But I will tell you this, probably 80% of my practice is criminal. Mm -hmm. And I can promise you, defendants know the difference between violent and nonviolent. Mm -hmm. They know. And they care. I think they probably do too, because they know that the violent means they'll actually have to serve 85%. They know and they care. And I think that's right. But if you do, if you would like to sit down and discuss that, and I, and I actually answered the chairman of this question earlier, um, I would absolutely be willing to work with you on that. I understand the con concerns of the, the, the draconian drug offenses. The problem, the reason the drug, war on drugs didn't work, because it was a war on drugs. 
They were focused all on the crime and they weren't focused on the underlying offender. And that's why it didn't work. And so if, if that's a part of what it is that we need to change, we've got a pretty impressive committee that's just looking at all aspects of, of sentencing. Thank you but for your time you. again. Thank you, yes, sir. sir. Yes, sir. All right, Ms. Kimmons, or Representative Kimmons. Thank you, Solicitor Stone, for coming and speaking with us again. Um, the 20 people that are in your drug court, is, is 20 your maximum capacity? Uh, we have had, um, uh, no, it's not. I mean, I, it, it's hard to tell because we, we're depending right now. We, we're also in a transition with Buford County Alcohol and Drugs saying we can no longer support that, and so we've got a little bit of issue there. Um, I don't believe it is. I don't I, to me, a capacity on a drug court is much, much, much higher than that, which is why we went out and got the grant to get the treatment people to do it. My people, as far as my director and my, and my underlying force and the, the solicitors I have working, that's not factored into the, uh, the, they can cover. If they need to cover 50 people instead of 20, we can do that. I've just got to get the treatment in place to do it. Mm -hmm. Veterans Court actually has a better program with that because the VA is, provides the treatment. The, uh, what we're working on now with that is trying to get a list from the department, from, from the DOA, uh, uh, DOD, excuse me, um, of who veterans are when they come into the system so that we can target them as they're coming in. And that's been surprisingly challenging. Uh, you know, obviously having a veterans court is something that the BRAC looks at and they take very seriously. Um, and, and if you have a veterans court, they look favorably upon that community uh, as far as the base realignments. But at the same time, if they could give us a list of the veterans that, that either lived in our area or there was some kind of computer list that we could hit, then we could identify them coming in. But the short, that's a long answer for your short question, but no, it's not at capacity. And I think our administrative end of it can handle it. I can get judges. The treatment is what is what has to be expanded, and that's the that's that's the uh, uh, that's the limitation issue. Okay, and the judges they are are they sought out by the solicitor's office? Do you determine who the judge is going to be, and then they are appointed by the Supreme Court? I rec I make recommendations. Yes, I make recommendations, and and quite frankly, I pay them. So I mean, you know, now it, we have we had Judge Fuge, Pete Fuge, our family court judge, did not pay him. We had worked early on on trying to create the system for juveniles uh, down there, and uh, um, certainly it wasn't a very difficult decision to, to propose him as a judge. Uh, obviously, if they're in the court system, I don't think they can get paid, so we don't, we don't pay those. But we have lawyers. Uh, Aaron Dean is a lawyer in Buford, and, and I'll be honest with you, I think, I think Aaron, I think Judge Dean is one of the best drug, I haven't gone to every drug court. But she does a phenomenal job, and she knows every one of these offenders. She knows all about them, and she is enthusiastic, and I'm more than happy to pay her the hourly rate to do it. Uh, and that just offsets the, the cost that she had being away from her, from her practice. And if they are, once they are appointed by the Supreme Court Justice, is that for a period of time or... We have had it, uh, we did not, I, I don't believe our orders had a period of time. I, I think that the, what was unusual about our order was that it was a multidisciplinary court. So we're trying to wrap these judges into covering not only drug court, but also mental health issues, also veterans, also domestic violence, any of these other areas as well. So, but I don't believe we put a, I'd have to check. I don't want to tell you something that's right. wrong. I don't, I, and I'll check and get back to you on that, but I don't. I don't think so, but I'll be glad that what I can do is I'll pull the orders and send them to you so okay. you can take a look at them. Sounds good. And um, would you agree with me that drug court has generational benefits? Oh, absolutely. Um, absolutely. Uh, I think a lot of, quite frankly, a lot of the criminal justice issues that we see are generational issues. Uh, are, uh, you know, you go back to domestic violence. I am convinced that domestic violence is a learned behavior. I mean, when you see children, when you see young boys 14 years old beating up not only their girlfriends but their mothers uh, they had to learn that from somebody and I, I think too often down in, in, in uh, for, for children what they see is what they think is normal what they see is what they're going to do and not only from boys beating their mothers but but the young girls 
think that's how they're supposed to be treated. And yes, I think it's tremendously generational. So I think if you address it from that context, I, that brings in sort of another aspect of why we call it the multidisciplinary court. When we were first starting our juvenile program, uh, I spoke to a drew, juvenile drug court judge who told me their program was not particularly successful because they were focused on trying to pigeonhole kids uh, into you got an alcohol problem or you have a drug problem, when in fact that wasn't the issue at all. There may have been a, there may have been a peer issue. There may have been a parent issue. There may have been all these other types of things. Reason we, the reason we call it a multidisciplinary court is I, I'm not pigeonholing any of them. Let's get them in the program. Let's see if we can figure out what the issue is and then address it. If that's mental health, fine. If it's they need parents, let's get them some mentors. And so, you know, if, if mom and dad are hooked on drugs and they're never getting treatment and child is left unattended, bad things happen to child, then child needs services, they grow up, and it's a, it's a cycle. Absolutely. And so um, it kind of brings me to drug court being hard, and I think someone brought up, well, shouldn't it? Maybe it's too hard. Um, but isn't that why it works? It is absolutely why it works. I don't think it can be. I, when it's hard, it's, it's not hard. It's hard for a reason. You have to go to court every week for the first third of, of our program because you need to have that regular cycle of being in front of a judge in a formal atmosphere. It, you know, as you start getting better, you don't have to go as much. But at first, you've got to go every week. You have to go to drug and alcohol treatment every week. You have to go to the group therapies every week. Somebody is going to show up at your house, and they are going to test you to see whether or not you're positive or not. And, and all of that, I don't see any of that that's an unnecessary uh, any unnecessary difficulty. I think that's why it works. If you didn't have any one of those components, I think that I think that would be a problem. I think that's all my questions. Thank you. I got one more. Thank you, Representative oh, Kimmons. Representative Hart. Make sure. Okay, this mic is working. Uh, Solicitor Stone, so make sure I'm correct. I was stating earlier, I think the carrot, uh, not the carrot, the stick is more effective than the carrot. Uh, when you have something hanging over someone's head in fear of punishment, um, here's the challenge here. Everything you just said, which I fully support, always been in support of drug court. Um, I've spoken several times at Judge Williams' drug court, um, which has been wonderful to see the results of that long process. But here's the challenge. We can spend the next week, the next months, talking in theory up here in this committee. The challenge is from a political science, pragmatic standpoint. How do you take what we're talking about now and put into a 30-second soundbite for the legislator who's going to vote to support funding for drug addicts? Because, see, I say that because I've had several of my colleagues say to different proposals that I put forward, I really would like to support you, but if I do, I won't get reelected. So everything we're talking about, everything that you just spoke about, the challenge is how do you put that into a political concept to make that legislator feel comfortable about pushing the green button to fund this program? Crime's expensive. Oh, I'm with you. Oh, and then that, I think that's it. Crime's expensive, and if you don't spend money on, on the, and the only way to make it cheaper, the only way to make it cheaper is to reduce recidivism. And the only way you could, and, and this is one of those programs that does that. I am a Republican um, from a very Republican county, and it's interesting to me that I talk about drug court and veterans court all the time, and, and the people down there support it. The town of Hilton Head, which is makes up a good bit of the, of the uh, more conservative uh, crowd of people that, that uh, make up the 14th Circuit uh, are the ones that are funding this program. So I think that, I think that people recognize that crime... Well, let's, let's be clear about that. Mm -hmm. They're funding the program for Buford. That's right. However... That's right. Would they be willing to fund the program, if it was possible, sure. to fund it for Allendale and Jasper and Collington County? 
That's the question. That's what I'm talking about. That's the challenge. Right. While it benefits my group, right. yes, it's great. Sure. But is it going to benefit someone outside of my group? Again, right. I'd be willing to support you, but I won't get reelected. Right. So the legislators that tell me that they have a certain group that they protect. However, Representative Hart, if I support your position, my people won't be so apt to reelect me because I'm supporting your position. That's the challenge and what I mean about what we're talking about here. And, and I think that that's why I, I'm comfortable standing up here making the, the discussion. What I am advocating for, although it might not be the most popular thing in all the land, uh, is a balance. I think you have to have a balance. And if you have a balance, no matter what side of the political spectrum somebody falls on, they can support at least half of it and talk about that half. And I think in the criminal justice system, you always have to have that balance. And if you don't have it, it's not going to be successful. And, the, and the, having somebody that just keeps reoffending and reoffending is not successful. You've got a good program; it costs money, but there's also got to be the stick. And and that's why what I'm advocating. That's why my recommendation number seven wasn't just fund drug court. And I know that that's the other end of that is not particularly popular, but the other end, the, but but it's balanced. I think you have to have a balance in the criminal justice system, and if you don't, it's not going to work. All right. Thank you, uh, Solicitor Stone. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank yes, you. Sir. And uh, next, uh, last speaker is uh, Mr. Pennington, Ninth Circuit Public Defender's Office. And just while he's coming up, Mr. Hart, Representative Hart, to your point, you know, the Sentence and Re Reform Oversight Committee <coughs> Commission, which has been in, was in existence for eight, eight years or so, one thing that uh, through our, through the recommendations from that commission, actually saved the taxpayers and one way we were able to sell continuing that commission was about 750 million dollars when you looked at what it would have cost us to build three additional state prisons and that's not even including the operation of those so that's one way that we were able to sell some of the recommendations of the commission to the general assembly and that was that was those were real savings <clears throat> by adopting adopting those recommendations. And I think that's how we have to sell this, is the cost of incarceration, the cost of a drug court. Mm -hmm. And I think when you talk money, people, that's what sometimes gets people's attention. All right. Thank you, Mr. Pennington. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, members of the committee. It's my honor to be here. My name is Ashley Pennington. I am the circuit public defender for Berkeley and Charleston counties. Um, I've had 20 years of experience with uh, therapeutic courts, starting when they were introduced in Charleston when I was a county public defender, and have followed their work since then. Um, let me start by saying something that you may not hear very often, which is good news. Uh, since the reform that Re Representative Murphy was talking about, um, in Charleston County in the last 11 years, well, let me back up, in the 2000s, we had 1,100 people coming to state prison from Charleston County alone every year, year in and year out, and about 1,100 were coming home. The new numbers, thanks to all the efforts to work on diversions, uh, alternatives to incarceration in Charleston County, is that our rate of incarceration from Charleston County has declined 60%, six zero. And so part of that is because of the work of the legal community in conjunction with the therapeutic community to find a whole spectrum of alternatives to incarceration. That still leaves a significant number of people who are being sent to our state prisons. And if you want to talk about, uh, that is a huge number of people who need the same service that we're talking about here in terms of a therapeutic recovery. And so uh, you have there a captive audience ready, willing, and often able to be served if they resources are, are present. But let's talk about the subject that's really at hand, the, the question of uh, who's going to drug court, why they go to drug court, what it costs to go to drug court, and what we might do to help drug court. Um, we don't get a dime, have never gotten a dime as public defenders in Charleston County or Berkeley County from the state or the county uh, to uh, participate, but we've participated every week for the last 20 years. In fact, it costs us money in Charleston County 
I hire a full-time, former full-time PD that retired from the active practice, and she works three days a week uh, on our two therapeutic adult courts, which are as a, a just an adult drug court and an adult mental health court. Uh, we do that because we believe that it is uh, beneficial, necessary, ethical, uh, important, and it's helping our clients. Um, now, it's a tricky business because what we're doing is we're taking what is an entity that is better run in terms of deciding adjudicative questions where there's conflict, where there's natural um, adversarialness, and pulling us in to become therapists. Because the real, what happens that's important in drug court is, is that it's a recovery process. We have a tough learning curve when we do this, and it creates qu lots of questions, conflicts, management issues. It has not been always easy. Um, I think one of the questions that was raised was, uh, what are the current challenges? Um, we are able to get people in in Charleston uh, over the hurdle of the money piece. Uh, I'm not comfortable with the, the uh, statute or the recommendations that require that you eliminate uh, people that have either a violent crime pending or stalking or who have been released in the last years from a violent crime for all the reasons uh, that my friend Solicitor Stone articulated better than I could, um, that usually what you're really looking at is, is this person someone that's ready to recover? Their motivation is key. Now, of course, we will all agree. We remember the Mary Lynn tragedy in 2002, I believe, where uh, there was a, uh, we were just birthing the Charleston County Mental Health Court, and a man was introduced to that court. He'd only been in a week, and he got out of jail and immediately went and killed this poor woman. Uh, and it sent shockwaves all across. That's the worst case scenario. And we've been running, really, from that case in Charleston County ever since. And there's still fear, terror, uh, that if we were to take the wrong person and have a recapitulation of that tragedy, that it would blow up therapeutic courts altogether. But in my opinion, um, we've now and should have established the credibility that we deserve to recognize that we have saved the lives of not only the participants, but family members and the community, uh, numbers and numbers of graduates from those courts. Um, in terms of what it takes to select the right person for drug court, it's actually a blend. Yes, you want to have a person who is saying, I want to change my life. And folks that are sick and tired of being sick and tired are the best possible and easy fit candidates if you can get them in. Uh, there are barriers in terms of uh, transportation and other things that we, we could talk about that we've worked through and still remain in probably these other counties. Um, maybe I should address that for the moment because I think there's a lot of concern here today is how broadly, what big, what size group are we serving? Uh, in Charleston County, we have 53 active participants in the adult drug court right now. Uh, in Berkeley, we started the Berkeley drug court for adults about two years ago, and we, I'm told that we have about 23 participants there. We've had a couple graduations already in that court. Uh, Solicitor Wilson just launched a uh, mental health court as well in Berkeley County. In Charleston County, we have uh, both the adult drug court and adult mental health court, a separate veterans court, and a juvenile drug court. They're all three very different. Uh, they all three have very different challenges. Um, the other kind of person that benefits from this sometimes is the person who does have a gun to his head or her head, who recognizes that it's this or significant periods of incarceration, and rather than go do significant periods of incarceration, I'll give this a try. Um, that is probably an appropriate analysis if you think about it. When I went to uh, Maryland last summer to the National Drug Court Conference, they stressed over and over and over again that this is for our tough offenders, our high-risk, high-need folks. Because what you're going to do is jump into the middle of their life. You're going to manage their life for the period of time. You're going to be telling them where to go in terms of you've got to show up here for testing, you've got to come and see your therapist, you've got to come to court, you've got to pay these fees, and you have to have a job. 
And so what you're really doing is truly rebuilding someone's life from the ground up. It is a holistic process and, and intended to be that so that people will shift their focus from the, a life of failure and dependency and addiction and low self-esteem uh, to where they can begin to see themselves in an entirely new way and that they, you can grow their self-esteem, their self-confidence, and their will to fight through the problems of their life and get invested in this new uh, experience of being sober and working for a living. It's not easy, but it is the path that we have to foster if we're going to see change. So it's tough. Um, with regard to, um, I think one of the grave misunderstandings, I think it does a disservice. I hope someday we can change it from calling these drug courts to calling them either treatment or recovery courts, because you're touching so many different things that go beyond the mere addiction. Uh, you have bad thinking, you have uh, uh, bad choices, um, and you have all of this is intertwined with the basic 12 steps that most of you are familiar with. I know this is a very sophisticated audience, lawyers often who have represented folks that we're talking about, where uh, recovery is mostly de deciding that you're going to accept an entirely different point of view and begin to feel good about it, so good that you want to stick with it, so good that you'll even give back to someone else which is really the turning point for most people in recovery. So um, one of the things that I think we need to get across, and you, you already understand this, but I don't know that the legislature as a whole does, is that this is the opposite of giving somebody a ham or a bone or a reward. This is an intensive therapeutic process, not for the faint of heart. And we're doing it for those that are the most high in terms of need and risk. Now, we have we, the people that are the highest risks we send to prison. And I would argue that what the failure of our current Department of Punishment rather than Corrections is, is that we've not invested in corrections or recovery. That is the group that is most in need by far. And I volunteer with a, a Christian-based uh, reentry program at Lieber. Uh, and when we were able to go in pre-COVID, uh, there are lots of guys that are eager to have this experience. Um, but we don't have the volunteers. We do not have the resources. And I don't blame anybody. I don't blame anybody. But you've talked about the pendulum. I, I've been doing this work for 40 years this month. And oh, I will tell you that in the 1990s, there was a very conscious and understandable choice that we were going to ratchet up penalties because it was going to be, it was just an unacceptable rate of crime. And we were thinking about how can we tamp it down. And I think that there can, you can understandably say that we experienced a decline in crime rate. But at what cost? And the cost was is that there should have been a commitment simultaneously. And if you listen closely to the background noise that goes on with the criminal justice system, President George H.W. Bush, not my favorite president, was talking about reentry in 2003 and four. Uh, he understood that there were 600,000 Americans in this country that were in prison who were in a position that could be influenced, and that it is the responsibility when we take them under our wing and we put them in our prisons, it's like putting them in our school. Our schools are failing terribly because the people that are there now are uh, frightened, they conform to a very negative environment, and there's a lot that we could say about how we could take these same principles, apply them in the correction system, and come out with a far better outcome. Back to where we go with this. Your bill, someone's bill, one of these two bills, talks a lot about tracking outcomes. And if there is a weakness right now that this legislature could make it a profound, valuable contribution on, yes, it's money because we don't have enough money for treatment. But the second piece, in my view, is that our courts have not tracked outcomes with the degree of rigor to uh, essentially validate and give you the ammunition to go take to the rest of the legislature that may not be as interested and say, look at the return on this investment. Now, I would say that it's frustrating because I went to law school probably because I'm not good with numbers. We do not have statisticians in our offices. We have, if you think about what we're paying for now, what you're paying for now largely is just the, what I would call the court apparatus and maybe some of the services that are rendered. 
but no one is funded to track outcomes and to see where people are a year after graduation. So we're really, we're really congratulating ourselves because we can get people to graduation. And I, I contend that one of these bills, both of them I really think, talk about following one of the 10 best practices, which is to have the solicitor generate an annual report that would have oversight here. There was going to be the creation of a someone in the solicitor's office who would be, not solicitor's office, the prosecution coordination that would oversee this. Now, it gets you a little queasy, because are you going to have good numbers? It doesn't matter. The bad numbers are going to tell you how to make good numbers. And so it, it, we need to have faith that we can use the skills, the strengths that we've learned in terms of therapeutic improvements and do better if we're, if we're not doing as well. It may be, I believe, that we need to steer people aggressively toward aftercare in the community, whether it's hopefully getting them involved as mentors for some of the people in the program, but if not in AA and other things, where we can track them and maybe even make them sort of peer counselors, um, which I think a lot of recovery is, it's hard not to want to check out. The world has gotten to be a very miserable place if you just watch TV. And a lot of people go home and have to numb themselves. They're certainly not going to get it from what they see on TV, and so they will use substances. And um, I don't see this problem going away. Uh, but you, if, if they find themselves engaged in something and helping someone else engage in positive behaviors, it will fuel sobriety. It will fuel the commitment toward their own success and service to the community. Um, so we've moved from 20 years ago where this was an experiment. We had to ask the question, would this work? And the answer is, it's not an experiment anymore. We know it works. There's no question about it. It has broad applicability. Um, now, I'm sure that there are people in this room right now that are saying, that guy is so full of it. Why isn't the Charleston County Juvenile Drug Court more actively utilized? Why doesn't his lawyers and his clients utilize that drug court? And this gets down into the weeds of the subtleties of how you have to run these things. Because truthfully, the, it is an art as well as a science to run a drug court. You have to be able to capture the hearts and minds of the participants, and you have to be able to have the right tools. We started out with the juvenile drug court in Charleston County, but we were blessed with the medical university that had a, uh, a pilot, brand new idea called multi-systemic therapy. It was completely paid for by the MUSC because they were basically doing research. That's what they do. And what you do with multi-systemic therapy is you bring in counselors into the home. And they did that with our juveniles in Charleston County for about 10, 15 years. And it worked brilliantly. Then they finished their study. And we didn't have the money. And it went away. And our drug court became more like an adult drug court, which is, is that it's just sort of go through these things and go to regular counseling. And we began to see that there was not the buy-in and there was not the success. The other thing you see is, is that it, the judges uh, and, and the solicitor are correct. You have to be, a lawyer has an ethical responsibility, responsibility to their client to tell them the truth. And if you're going to tell someone what this is, it's going to say, this is going to turn your, it's going to take over your life. Do you want that or do you want probation? And a lot of people say, you know what, I'm going to take the probation. Um, the reality is, is that I believe a juvenile drug court that used multisystemic therapy, we could do, have more selling points that would help this family and this child be more bought in to a recovery scheme. Now, it ain't cheap. Multisystemic therapy is the state of the art in terms of helping failing families, multi-generational problems, and people recover from them. Um, but I guess we come back to the question of can we afford not to? This is going to be the difference maker, I believe, in our culture as to whether or not we are going to essentially have the sink or swim mentality and build prisons, which I now, we now know is so refreshing. In the 90s, I, we could not have heard the comments that have been made from the podium here about how disillusioned people are with prisons, and rightfully so. We know that they do one thing very well. They incapacitate. And they really do that well. And that, and that has a value. The question is, though, when 98% come home, you reap what you sow. And if we have not worked with those people, you can see I have a bee in my bomb about corrections. Because to me, 
It is the unexplored last frontier to making our system great. If we could work on these things, it could make it a, a, the best criminal justice system in the world. We're not there yet. We certainly have an excellent adjudicative system, but we've not matched it. You know, in, in England and other countries where they have a, a, an intense sense that we don't have a boundless frontier and we don't have, you know, that people aren't disposable, they know full well that when people come out of prisons in Germany, France, and England, that they're going to be in the same village. And so they, they make a very conscious, direct investment in their prison system because it makes a difference and because they reap the benefits. We can't think that the people who are incarcerated are the others because they're really us. Now, there are going to be folks, we all know, and I can, you know, it's like the Mary Lynn phenomenon. Uh, for every do-gooder kind of thing I say, I can cite you, I do capital defense. I, I, I work on the worst cases in my county and have for 30 years. And so I know that there are horrible crimes and that they're going to have to result in lengthy outcomes. You don't have to sell me on that. Um, at the same time, I think that there is a giant crisis because we've, we've pulled the low-hanging fruit in terms of our reform of criminal justice. Now we're down to the hard stuff, the stuff that's going to really require us to roll up our sleeves and get serious about helping people find a way out of the mess that they've made out of the life that they have. I don't think it's a question of whose blame it is. I don't think that's a productive discussion. I think it's a question of where do we go from here. Um, and I think we know and we see, you know, I, I, uh, our director of the Department of Corrections gets everything I'm saying and is working hard with every tool he has in his toolkit. He's a great guy. I love him. Uh, he needs help badly. Um, and so drug courts are great because it keeps people out of that system and they're doing that work and they're expensive and valuable. Um, they're not going to solve the overall criminal justice system, but they point the way. And um, for juveniles that could get multi-systemic therapy, it points the way. Um, and it ain't easy to do this because sometimes you, when you're marrying up the therapy side with the lawyer side, the lawyers love to fight, and we don't take it personal, but sometimes the therapists get very angry, turned off. Uh, it's a complex investment of our time and energy. That's why I think that we need to focus on the people that are the most at risk, most in need, and that's usually people that you're going to send to prison if you don't put them in this program. So that's why I think that the distinction between the, the type of offense does take you down the wrong road. Now, the, the, the fact is, one of these things talks about giving the solicitor discretion. I think that's probably where it ought to lie. Uh, it's a question of how comfortable the solicitor is with the particular facts, and that's where, you know, ultimately all of this is in sentencing and bond setting and drug court. We're all gamblers. We can't predict the future. But what we do is we try to lay out that healthy pathway, and uh, I think that we can attract a heck of a lot more people down that healthy pathway. Um, so this is not PTI. It is not a reward. This is a rigorous, tough, uh, it needs to be accessible on a broad based, uh, and I think it's worth every nickel that gets put into it, particularly if, this is the thing I really want to stress, we, to the extent that our drug courts and therapeutic courts have had trouble, it's because we often sit and just sit and argue the same points, and we're not using reference points that are outside of us or tracking our outcomes. And I think that we're asking people to do with no funding a lot more than they've ever done before in terms of collaboration and thinking and working with ex uh, experts. Um, I think the tracking of outcomes is essential. Reports are essential. Oversight is essential uh, because it's going to require us to all be more flexible, step up our game a little bit. Um, I think that uh, Mr. Ryan, who's here from the Indigent Defense Office, would like me to say that public defenders ought to get paid too, and I, I kind of agree with that because we don't have enough money to do everything we do. Um, but I think you can tell from my tone that from in the trenches, we want what's best for our clients. And so we'll fight for this if it's working. Um, I think it ought to be more broadly available. And I'll be happy to answer any questions.
All right. Um, kind of running up on time, but real quick, I just want to ask you, um, <clears throat> you said get away from drug court, call it treatment or recovery court. One thing that I've, while well, I listen is in Charleston, y'all have the benefit of having a drug court, a veterans court, mental health court. I think you named another one. A juvenile. Uh, ju the juvenile court. But as far as would it make sense when we're talking about the, um, the lack of funds or the availability of monies? And is it even possible that instead of we talk about drug court, we put every, everybody under the umbrella of a treatment court, whether you're suffering from PTSD. I mean, mm -hmm. if you're suffering from PTSD, you tend to have a, a drug or alcohol addiction um, or a mental health component where you're self-medicating. So would it, would it make sense to bring them all under the umbrella of one court? Um, mm. Would that be possible? I don't think you could do it with the juveniles. Now, uh, with take regard the juveniles to the, out of the, the, the equation because yeah. they, they... With regard to... The mental health folks have unique needs and probably need some sort of breakout. Uh, we broke out the veterans because there was a sense of, and this was debated hotly, you know, we already had veterans in our regular adult court. We created a separate treatment court because we were shooting for the idea of creating an environment where the veterans would be helping veterans. It'd be sort of like a kind of a special intimate community of people in recovery that would have that special charism or quality. Um, so yes, I think you could combine those two. Um, I do think that uh, you are, in some ways, doing the same task in different ways. You know, in, with the mental health court, what you're really trying to do is to get them to take drugs, because a lot of these folks, they're not taking the drugs mm -hmm. that they're supposed to take. Um, and so it's a different style, a different feel. It's much warmer, and you, get more, you have to get more intimate with these folks. Ultimately, what really works in the courts that I've seen around the country is a sense of the kinship that you've developed with the, between the court itself and the participant. That creates the buy-in, that connection. So that is a very consistent piece of successful courts. Um, so I don't think I've answered your question. Uh, maybe I don't understand your question. I think you could call them all treatment or recovery courts. You may not want to operate them on the same day at the same time. Yeah. Well, we're all, everybody seems to be competing over the same dollars. They are, of so, course. Um, Absolutely, it's a tough, tough to operate. Combine, you know, some, some com combination, and then if you have to, you know, send the veterans over there to where they can talk with somebody that has a like experience. Uh, that, um, but I just think that's something we may need to look, look at going forward. Um, any other questions for Representative Hart? Any oh, yeah. questions? I did. Um, yes, sir. You, you mentioned something um, about the prison population and that being the last, what was the, the phrase you used about what we could do with the prison population if we invested in that? Well, I, 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 my view of it is, is that we are losing the, the great investment we've made. We've made a huge investment in buildings and staff, um, but not in the programming. It's like having a school with no curriculum. Uh, we're there, they're their uh, captive audience, but we're not utilizing their time effectively. And so the question is, um, I know that we, you know, if you read the Department of Corrections statutory law, there's all kinds of talk, good talk, about um, recovery and programming and things like that, and uh, they do the best with the tools they have. But if you go to these maximum security prisons or some of the other places that I've visited, um, the resources are spotty. You know, you have some really, really good places and places where nothing's happening. And uh, any place that nothing's happening, bad things are happening. Bad things. Um, and so um, I just see it as a golden opportunity. My dream when I retire is to find a way to advocate for the prisons because it just seems to me a golden, you know, if you have people that want help, you give them help. And they'll probably separate themselves. There'll be some guys that'll just say thumb their nose. But the truth is, is that there's a lot of men in prison 
that just need a chance to kind of get away from that and into something more positive. I'm not saying move them out of the prison. I'm talking about in different headspace where they are connecting regularly with volunteers or with professionals, probably a blend of both, to be able to get them um, thinking about pro-social uh, lifestyles and ways that they can feel good about themselves and ready them for employment and uh, sobriety. Right, and, and, and you mentioned how these other countries, France, England, Germany, uh, Germany um, had taken a concerted effort to invest in the, the, the prisoners or the folks who were uh, in prison at the time because they realized that at some point in time, they're gonna come back into the village and they're gonna affect us. Uh, so the challenge becomes for us here in America, United States of America, and no matter where you go, what city, state, doesn't matter. Um, on the county jail level or even the prison state level or even the federal level, there's a certain demographic that's incarcerated. Sure. That's overly incarcerated. Right. And that creates the majority of the incarceration for the prison system. So the question becomes is how do we get legislators up here to invest in that population that doesn't look like them? I think they need to meet some ex-offenders who have, uh, are in recovery and who can tell the story better than I can. Uh, people who have uh, the lived experience and who have found uh, a new life uh, and who are giving back and who um, can sort of, I think with more credibility, uh, chart the path a little bit, shine the light. Um, so, and the other thing I suppose is, is that I think your wardens and your uh, people, your staff, know that there is, I, I see this as a huge actual resource for the country. In other words, this is sort of a huge number of men sort of waiting to discover themselves and become contributors rather than liabilities. And I'm convinced that we can turn the majority. I can't say that everybody in there is going to drink the Kool-Aid and come out and become Mother Teresa's. I can say that prison is very punitive. It's very rough. They don't want to be there. So you've got the, care, you've got the stick working. And then you, you paint them a healthy pathway where they can find jobs, support their families without having to sell dope. I think you got something there. Iowa has the best... <clears throat> uh, prison industries program because they've gotten past and nobody wants to reward people for going to prison and you know the image that I've heard recently revived is the idea that uh, we that somehow I don't really know how the truth of this but the, you'll hear the story of that prison chain gangs and all were designed to help farms and other things and that there may be truth to all of that the reality though is is that that cannot defeat the argument that people need to work to be mentally healthy. You have to learn two things to be mentally healthy, how to love and how to work. And helping people find gainful employment is an investment in them, their success. It is in no way deprecating. It is no way harmful. And so, uh, and that's a huge part of uh, reentry and successful reintegration. Mm -hmm. That's all. Thank you, Representative Hart. Any Further questions? I can't remember the, the name of the group that uh, when we did the sentencing reform bill, they came at the end and they were talking a lot about what it was, it was a group that was talking that we needed to invest more in the trans instead of just warehousing people in the Department of Corrections. If Christy if, Danford from the Charleston, it was that it? The Charleston County Coordinating Council, what, juvenile, we have a Justice Coordinating Council, which is the only reason I haven't already retired. Um, well, I'm having too much fun, I think, right now, because the, the Coordinating Council has allowed all the stakeholders, the judges, the solicitor, and the uh, other participants, including mental health and substance abuse, to come together weekly to work on recovery activities that has been a game changer. That's how you get the kind of beneficial results we talked about. Our jail population is down. Uh, our prison population is down. 
we still got huge, 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 huge hurdles because we're now down to the people who are the most difficult to treat mental health wise or the folks that, um, uh, you know, the, the folks who you let them out and they're back in a week or back in six weeks, either because they've again gotten another fight with their spouse or because they're back involved with uh, drugs either from use or from sales because it is the only life they know. And um, those chronic systemic problems are the ones that really need to be tackled next. They came in at the almost the ninth hour when we were about to put the bill up on in, I think to the floor. And I, we staff put them in touch with Brian Sterling and said, you know, that's where you need to start, you know, get some buy-in from director Sterling on, um, on, on making some changes in the Department of Corrections. But uh, I really think with all due respect, he is completely there. It's purely a question of, of course, COVID is a whole nother world. But uh, when pre-COVID, when we were having staffing issues, you'd have volunteers uh, every week ready to show up and you were having lockdown after lockdown after lockdown because you couldn't get in. Right. Because I think we've got to change the whole culture to where people uh, where it's safer to be in prison, so you want to work there and you believe something positive is happening, I think that would boost the morale of not only the inmates but the, the guards and make it a, a, a campus where people would want to be. Not, for, not to serve time necessarily, but to see uh, the beneficial activities going on. I agree. All right, well, thank you, um, Judge Wait. Yes, sir? I'll give you one. All right, yes, sir. A judge outranks a public defender and a solicitor, so. I, you know. Well, I'm just, I'm agreeing really to, to things uh, that have been said. and want to thank both of them because they have both been supportive of what we've done with drug courts over the years. A few things. Didn't want you to leave or be misled about the grants. The grants won't fund these. They're great to come back and to do a redo like we're doing in Richland County with the juvenile drug court or to get new courts started. But it's not a, a funding mechanism that can be used on a continuous basis that, that can be used to some improvement. But this is an unusual year for South Carolina to happen to get three. Uh, a lot of years it's none because usually I'm aware of them and try to help others when they are making application for them uh, and uh, in the grant process. A couple of things. This reference to high need, high risk, there's, you look at that definition of high need, high risk, uh, some may look at it with the offense itself. It may be what I mentioned earlier about the this r risk of being involved in the system more so than a particular offense. But there are some studies that show that those who do have the higher need, higher risk are very successful with these alternative courts and treatment courts. Uh, and the studies would prove that out. So I think you, it would be where it could be considered uh, for those to, uh, individuals to, to participate. Uh, a couple of things, question was asked about judges' salaries. The state judges do not receive payment when they participate. There's a few of us who, who do it. There's not a lot, but that's where the money comes in. And essentially when it was set up, the money that's coming in is run through the slip versus I don't look at it as a solicitor paying the judge per se. It was intention. The intention was it's got money's got to go somewhere, so it's a run through. But I do think it's a wonderful idea to have uniform salaries to take any issues off the table and and and, uh, and get some uniformity as to how you select the judges. The uh, getting before a judge, which means getting them into the courts, uh, it goes back to the high need, high risk. I guess at some point, you know, how long do you want to wait till they have that highest need and highest risk? or maybe earlier when you have the recognition that they have some needs and need treatment um, versus waiting to it may be too late or a, a much more difficult process to get them uh, uh, before a judge and be involved in the court. The, what the studies have shown, being in front of a judge, um, there's one that has, um, that, uh, um, that has had great impact on me that I read about and, and, and our staff has used it. Two minutes before a judge, Two minutes before a judge, if a judge during a, during a guilty plea, when you all are there, would take the time to talk to a defendant for two minutes. Their studies, their studies shows uh, potentially 50% more likely to succeed at their probationary sentence. Just two minutes. The longer the judge will talk, I brought a speaker in to the circuit court judges that very purpose to explain when you're doing a plea. It's, you know, I understand the questions you have to ask, but the judge will take time and talk. Just that little bit of time will increase their likelihood of success. 
So when we're talking about with drug courts, all that time, week in and week out, hopefully that's what helps is that relationship. And that what the judge can do with that, though, is find the resources and treat the family, well, everything Mr. Pennington's talking about. If it's done right, adult or juvenile, it's not just the person in front of you. It is family, children, and, and getting that getting them in there. That's why I say that in some ways, uh, I, 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 I'm not a proponent of always waiting because if you can get them in there, the person who can help them are those the treatment people in the court and encouraging and, and, and nudging things along the right way to the right folks to get the treatment that they need. Um, the, um, the fees that were mentioned, there are studies, again, and again, drug court over the years has, has been science-based and fact-based. There is, there is some uh, showing that you've got some stake in it. It does encourage it, but I'm not aware of anyone being removed because they couldn't pay fees or some, not, some fees along the way. And, Ms. Hart, your question about uh, educating the public, the good news over the last number of decades, um, Mr. Pennington mentioned President Bush. Well, President Bush, President Obama, President Trump, have all been supportive of drug courts, as I indicated, and you see the photograph at the White House recently uh, in the last year. They've all been supportive, and I think that ultimately is the goal, is to educate the public um, about what these alternative courts do, these treatment courts do, um, and, and I think that helps us convince the public, because in speaking to uh, Kiwanis clubs and other things, other groups around the state doing what I've done with, with drug court, um, that's uh, educating seems to help solve some of the problems of getting people to accept alternative ways of looking at things and, and uh, because of the success we've had. The last thing, the tracking, the outcomes. Back in the day when we got started, I had a choice. I could pay, uh, well, one expert wanted $50,000 to track and give us all the, the criteria and the data. Personally, I wanted to spend $50,000 on treatment, and that was the choice you had to make. So I think it's, it will certainly be helpful and good to us, but sometimes that's been the practical matter over the last time. With the funding, um, hopefully it will continue. Uh, hopefully it will be better. Uh, I think, too, you're not really, not really talking about new dollars when you look at this. If you look at the budget now, there are line items in the budget. There are fees and fines throughout the budget. There are different various statutes relating to drug court fees. And I think when you have your staff look at that, what that totals up to be, it's not as much many new dollars as you might think to help do the things that you're talking about now and with some uniformity uh, as well. Again, thank you for your time and uh, letting me come join you. Thank you very much. Thank you.